your opinions to a degree of reasonable professional certainty based on generally accepted standards in, in your field? Yes, I have. Now, before sharing those opinions, sir, I would like you to please explain you know, what factors you review when you're evaluating uses of force. Sure. So first, as sort of a threshold point, I have to know what I'm actually looking at, right? I have to know which uses of force I'm actually reviewing. Um, for example, if an officer is involved in a shooting, the saying is the officer has to account for every bullet that they put downrange. That is, they might they, they count as separate uses of force. After I identify what the uses of force are, then I apply essentially a four-step analytical framework. First, I identify what the relevant facts and circumstances are as viewed through the lens of a reasonable officer on the scene. Then I assess the threat, if any, presented by the individual's actions. Then I assess the foreseeable effects of the officer's use of force and then the fourth step is sort of putting all of that together and assessing whether, in light of the facts and circumstances, the foreseeable effects of the officer's use of force were justified and reasonable because they were proportional and appropriate in light of the threat presented by the individual's actions. By what standard are you making this assessment? So the, the ultimate analytical question, that, that uh, step four, is applying generally accepted police practices, what we might call a national or professional standard for the way we expect and the way policing uh, expects officers to engage with individuals and use force. And what are these national standards based on? So a combination of things. They're certainly influenced by constitutional law, for example. Uh, by history and research in policing since the 1970s or so. There's been um, tactical research within policing that's helped inform uh, what we would now consider generally accepted practices, um, a great deal of evidence and experience as well. Uh, are there constitutional standards as well? Yes, constitutional law, especially the Fourth Amendment standard, is one of the factors that um, defines or certainly influences the generally accepted practices. Is, is another influence a, a particular department's uh, policies and training? Uh, an agency's policies or training uh, might, and indeed I would hope they are, um, reflective of the generally accepted practices, but we can't define industry-wide generally accepted practices by looking at a particular agency's policies or training. So, so the standard you're reviewing is that of reasonableness? That's correct. Um, now we might look at a large number of agencies and say, okay, if hundreds or many, many police agencies are doing this thing, then maybe that's a best practice or a generally accepted practice. But you can't just look at one agency and say, it's reasonable because this one agency said it was reasonable. All right. Um, when discussing the constitutional standards, you're familiar with the standards set forth in Graham versus Connor? I am, yes. And uh, you have a demonstrative, uh, I believe it's a Exhibit uh, 954. And if I could publish that, the Graham factors. Okay. 954 is received for demonstrative purposes only. Right. And can you just please uh, tell the jury um, the, what, what it is you see here? So this is a summary of what are referred to as the Graham factors. These are specific factors identified by the Supreme Court in the case Graham v. Connor that we use really in that second phase of analysis. And the second step, remember, is uh, assessing the threat presented by the individual's actions. And to understand uh, Graham v. Connor, kind of have to understand what we mean by threat. Um, first, when we're talking about the threat that an individual may present, it's not some abstract notion. It's not general threat or conceptual. It's specific threat of something, right? Someone who's running away may present a threat of escape or a threat of assaulting an officer or the like. And further, we can define threat. We know that threat exists 
when the individual has the physical ability and the opportunity and the apparent intention to cause whatever specific harm we're analyzing. So for example, um, imagine someone who's just standing there with nothing in their hands. They don't have the physical ability to hit an officer with a tire iron. So there's no threat that an officer is going to be hit with a tire iron. There's just no physical ability there. On the other hand, imagine someone who has a tire iron but who's 50 feet away. They have the physical ability because they have a tire iron, but they don't have any opportunity. They're too far away in that moment to actually present a threat. And then we could imagine someone who has a tire iron and they're two or three feet away from an officer, but they're changing a tire at the time. They have the ability and the opportunity, but there's nothing about that interaction as the officer is talking with them that suggests they have the apparent intention to cause that particular threat. So when you put all of those three things together, ability, opportunity, and intention, that's how we identify threat. The Graham Conner, uh, I'd like you to contrast that with risk. Oh, sure. Um, so threat, as I've defined it, can be contrasted with risk. Risk you can think of as a potential threat. That person with the tire iron who's 50 feet away, they don't present a threat. If they get close enough, they might have the opportunity now or the apparent intention to strike an officer with the tire iron, but they don't yet. So risk is something that officers can use tactics and communication to help address. The goal is to prevent risk from becoming threat and really to prevent threat from becoming whatever that relevant harm is. Uh, but while threat can justify use of force, risk can't. An officer can't use force on someone who's holding a tire iron and two or three feet away while they're just changing a tire because there's no apparent intention, there's no threat there. The officer can do something like back away, build distance so they aren't two or three feet away, or interpose the vehicle between themselves and the individual they're interacting with, or use communications. They could uh, ask the individual to put the tire iron down, but they can't use force there because there's no threat. The I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, this is what you get for having a law professor testify. And they're trying so hard to take notes and court reporters trying to take things down. So I'm going to slow you down a little bit, if I may, Professor. Sure, sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, uh, then in assessing other potential risk factors, would you agree that the relative size of a person is a risk factor? It's certainly a relevant consideration, yes. Um, but is it in and of itself a threat? Uh, no, certainly not. Um, someone who's physically large may have a greater physical ability to uh, inflict harm if they assault an officer, but that their size can't establish opportunity and can't establish intention. And uh, how about a recent drug use? Is that a threat or a risk? Again, it's a relevant consideration, but it does not in and of itself establish a threat. Um, it doesn't establish physical ability by itself to do anything. It doesn't establish opportunity to do anything, nor does it establish apparent intention. So it's certainly a relevant consideration in the totality of the circumstances, but officers can't use force on someone just because they're on drugs. Now, I'd like to talk about, I'd like you to dis discuss the uh, severity of the crime at issue. How is that relevant to the, uh, the Graham analysis? Sure, so as we're thinking about the, the concept of threat, the Graham factors really help us identify when there's a threat and how much of a threat. Uh, severity of the crime can be best understood as a proxy for dangerousness. Uh, all other things being equal, an armed bank robber may be suspected to be more dangerous than someone who is cashing a worthless check, for example. Um, so severity of the crime is really, um, a, really a proxy for evaluating how much risk someone might present, how dangerous are they. And if we could go to the third factor then, the, uh, uh, the, the active resistance, whether they are actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight, how is that relevant to your analysis? Um, so again, this is all part of that threat analysis, that second step in my, in my framework. 
Uh, and this is getting at the behavior of the subject. So for example, someone who's attempting to evade arrest by flight is threatening the government's interest in apprehending that person. It's about identifying a threat of escape. Um, active resistance can be similar. It's a threat of someone frustrating the government's interest in taking them into custody, for example. Um, we talk, are there different types of resistance? Uh, yes, absolutely. What are the types generally accepted uh, definitions in policing as the different types of resistance? Sure. So the concepts are certainly generally accepted, although some of the vocabulary uh, differs from place to place. Um, we might first identify someone who is uh, compliant, who's doing what the officers want, no resistance at all, right? Uh, then we might have someone who is passive or non-compliant. They're not doing what the officers want, but they're not doing anything against what the officers are telling them to do either. Uh, the classic example of passive resistance is someone who's just laying on the ground refusing to get up when told. Then there's active resistance, which is typically defined as someone who is engaging their muscles in some way. Someone who's tensing up or someone who's running away is engaged in active resistance. The next level up, if we can say that, is uh, active aggression. And this is where someone is not just engaging their muscles, they're engaging their muscles in a way that creates a threat of harm to the officers or someone else. And finally, the ultimate expression of active aggression is when a subject presents an imminent threat, again, as that term is defined, of death or serious bodily injury to officers or others. Okay. If we can take that down, please. Now, I think we've gone through uh, in a little more detail the first two steps of your four-step process. Uh, talk about identifying facts that would have been apparent to a reasonable officer. You've discussed uh, identifying threats. Uh, you also testify that you need to identify the foreseeable effects of the officer's actions. Can you explain what you mean by that? Absolutely. What I mean by the foreseeable effects of the officer's actions is essentially what is this use of force likely to do? Just as there is a spectrum of resistance from no resistance to a whole lot of resistance, right, threatening the life of an officer, there's also a spectrum of effects that we might expect from an officer's use of force. Uh, so for example, some uses of force are relatively minor and unlikely to cause any more than temporary discomfort. Other uses of force are substantially likely to cause death or serious bodily injury, what we would refer to as deadly force. As you're analyzing use of force, it's very important to focus on the foreseeable effects of what the use of force uh, involved and not the actual effects, not what actually happened. And I can give you uh, an easy example. If an officer shoots at someone, that's a use of deadly force because it's foreseeable that discharging a firearm at someone is going to cause death or serious bodily injury. And that's true even if the officer misses entirely or if the bullet hits the person but causes a very superficial injury, let's say it just scrapes them. It's still a use of deadly force because of the foreseeable effects, not the actual effects. And that concept of uh, foreseeable effect is what's foreseeable really at the time force is being used. And uh, Professor Soden, uh, the fourth uh, factor that you testified about, determining whether the officer's actions are appropriate, proportional, and reasonable. Can you please explain what you mean by appropriate, proportional, and reasonable? Yes, so what we're talking about is sort of a balancing of harms here. Uh, this also pulls from Graham v. Connor and the Fourth Amendment uh, standard, which talked about balancing the individual interest against the government interest. The idea is an officer cannot use more force than the situation justifies. That is, the foreseeable effects of the officer's use of force can't be disproportionate to the threat presented by the individual's actions. And sir, did you take all of these uh, factors into consideration in your performing your analysis in this case? Absolutely, yes. I uh, ask uh, if you uh, assisted with the preparation of a demonstrative exhibit, demonstrative uh, 953. Yes, I did. And would the uh, use of that demonstrative exhibit assist you in explaining your analysis and testimony to the jury? 
uh, yes, and especially how those factors apply. Um, offer exhibit uh, 953 for demonstrative purposes. Any objection? Very 